Hello and welcome to Enter the Boardroom with Neural. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of Neural, the board search specialist and market leader, bringing science to the art of board hiring. Today's guest, Rebecca Robbins, is founder and CEO of a consultancy at the intersection of brand, culture and leadership, working with owners, founders and leaders across the world. She is an advisory council member at the Chartered Management Institute, lecturer at the University of Cambridge and advisor at an AI for Good company. More on that soon. She has a 20-year career in brand and business consultancy, most recently as Global Chief Learning and Culture Officer at Interbrand, the leading brand agency, and as Nominations Committee Chair at the EY Foundation. A best-selling author, Rebecca has recently co-authored her third Five Generations at Work, How We Win Together for Good, with Patrick Dunn, a former guest on Enter the Boardroom. Rebecca, a huge welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Great to see you, Ollie. Thanks for having me on your best-selling podcast. Great pleasure to be here. So, Rebecca... Your book is not yet out, so I haven't had the chance to read it. Can you summarise what you see as the five generations opportunity? Well, you're a first mover in the UK, Ollie. So it is a bit of a preview. It's out 26th of September, so mark your calendars. So why it came into being, we have five generations at work for the first time in history. And this is the punchline coming up. We have seriously been having the wrong conversation about generations. We're living longer. We shall need and want to work longer. And that's all tra- already transforming the demographics of the workplace and many workplaces across the world. The point about the wrong conversation, and we were just talking about this earlier, is this divisive discourse that has been fueled by silos, by stereotypes, and by the clickbait headlines that we continue to see every day, almost pitting generations against each other. And I have conversations with business business leaders, people leaders, next gen, uh, every week about this, because this is creating unnecessary noise, confusion and distraction. And really, as the responsible and collaborative leaders, as, as board members, what we want to understand is simply, we have five generations at work for the first time in history. That's hugely exciting, especially in the context of our times. How do we think about that, therefore, more productively through the lens of people as individuals, as collectives, and we hardwire it through what the business needs to do. And the second point about why it came into being was also we really don't have time to waste. We're here in 2024. There is an urgency and complexity of our times when we think about a lot of the what's being dubbed the poly crisis. You've talked about it on a number of your pods, climate, geopolitics, the rise of tech and with it all the potential, but also the challenges that it's already bringing. But again, with the knowledge, experience and expertise that we have with five generations in the workplace for the first time, That's a huge opportunity. It's an immense opportunity to hardwire into the things that we need to solve for and the opportunities. And it's as close as we get to looking at it potentially through some form of renaissance. So I think there's a perspective here that we need to have a bit of a reset, knowing we're in the reality of a five generation workplace. Let's look at that more productively, collaboratively and to our competitive advantage. Besides biases and stereotypes, do you see any other issues obstructing collaboration between generations? I love that you brought up collaboration as a word because I think collaboration is probably one of the most overutilized terms in business and probably one of the most under-indexed in terms of what we do about it intentionally. We'll see collaboration or collaborative show up as one of the many values of companies or organizations, but how do we really intentionally invest in building collaborative muscle through our organizations and bonding and binding people is one thing which you know should be happening through how we're investing in our culture but i do think the workplace is evolving and that demographic is expanding we are engaging we are going to need to engage in different ways and i think there are some common patterns and principles that came through the research and through the work one of them is a huge thing ollie and it ties into collaboration which is around both respect for each other and understanding and respect for each other and linked with mutuality and a mutuality of mindset so shifting from social media which has fueled the narcissistic id if you will and it's you know it's the personal brand and there's nothing wrong with the personal brand whatsoever but it has to be more about it has to be more than the me right it's, it's sort of shifting that conversation from the me and then again the media doesn't help with this I mean you've probably got better stats on this than I have I think the last ones I had were, were for every positive story in the media it gets shared what 50% of the time that a negative story does so that stat alone puts us in the context of even what we're seeing in our feeds what's showing up what's not showing up it's feeding polarization so where polarization already exists that gap is getting larger so the imperative 
for collaboration is stronger and we're not doing enough about it. So when I talk about collaborative muscle, it's interesting, I've done work with the brilliant Oxford Character Project, which is linked to Saeed and the business school. And that really is investing in how are we building more muscle in character-led leadership? And that's all about collaborative leadership. I mentioned Lena Nair earlier on. She is talking about this a lot. She is um, an individual who has come in at a highest leadership role in one of the leading luxury brands, never before in the history of Chanel, and come from a people-based background. And she is retooling the way in which they think about leadership in that organization. She talks about connecting collaborative leadership to collective intelligence. And there is hard work to be done for us all. It's not impossible either. It's not rocket science. It is just putting the sort of the, the everyday work and muscle in and what you'll see evidenced in the book are really really straightforward examples of doing this and again what's so inspiring to me through the research and through the work that I've been seeing across the world is that it's so invariably sparked by one individual which is so exciting one individual sees an opportunity they start a conversation and then the rest ca- cascades and that could be in global organizations like lvmh with over two hundred thousand people or it could be in a non-profit like lewis hamilton's foundation mission 44 which just started up a few years ago which already is doing everything with the young people at the head and heart of what they do so the point is again these things can manifest in different ways but we have to build collaborative muscle and they and I love, I mean, they they talk about it, Mission 44 and the work that they are doing. Everything they do is hand in hand with the young people that they are serving as a foundation. And I think if we apply that mindset in business more and connect that into just the way that we look at things and the way that we do at things, it becomes much more of a habit than an exception. The importance there you place on respect and humility reminds me of a recent discussion we had on in one of our mastermind groups where we had two members from two different generations talking about uh, bringing up climate change in the boardroom and the younger generation member was talking about the struggle bringing up climate change in the boardroom and how they weren't being taken seriously with that they were bringing up climate change and they felt they were being dismissed and one of the the others in the the, the group actually represented an older generation and they had sat on the other side of the table with one of the members in their boardroom who was they felt was banging on about climate change and being really irritating and what was fascinating to see was in this safe space this mastermind Mm. where no one had any agendas other than to help each other they were both able to move closer to the other side's perspective simply because in that room there was no face to be lost there was respect for one another and it was absolutely wonderful to see and i think it really highlights the point that you're making there that the stereotypes if you can somehow foster that respect and humility in the room that they become a lot easier to tackle Absolutely. And I love that you picked up on on those two words of mutual and respect. Actually, mutuality is also one of the principles that you'll hear when we're in conversation with Mars, one of the leading family businesses that's featured in the book. Picking up on safe space, I think, is so important. I think it's no surprise that actually Amy Edmondson won every award that was going last year uh, for her for her latest book and more. And of course, that's a continuation of that work that you can't do a lot of this without without safe spaces. And I think, again, safe spaces doesn't mean to say that uh, these are easy spaces the importance is actually the safer the platform the braver the conversations that you can have I think there's something two interesting things you're touching on there there's something around when boards are considering diversifying perspectives around the table where is that intention coming from because where it goes wrong invariably is if people feel compelled or forced necessarily or however it's come about but it, it happens and it's t- and it's tokenistic so that, that is invariably where things go wrong and it's not fair on the individual it's not fair on the board so i think that's an important point i think the second piece which is around diversity of perspectives uh, and the ability again for each party to come together so first of all i love the fact that you do this on your masterminds because you're, you're actually building that coll- collaborative muscle so kudos to you in terms of you're creating a safe space you're bridging across generations you're enabling cross-generational dialogue fantastic you definitely have to be in the book next time around but th- this is precisely what is not just happening in boardrooms but it's happening in so many contexts of what we're seeing across organizations you know are 
are we able to elicit perspective from everybody who needs to be in the room? And there's a lovely triumvirate that Martha Lane Fox uses. And her last one is, do we have the right people in the room? So there's this trifecta that she uses for a lot of different scenarios. And I love that. I always come back to that. And I think, again, if we stop and think for a moment, in especially in our role as board members and leaders or founders and family business owners, let's put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. One of the principles I talk about in the book is a seventh generation principle, which I absolutely love. And, you know, we, we, we've all listened to and seen Roman's TED Talk, which is absolutely wonderful. And I, I feature work from the Future Generations Act. And the reason I talk about future generations is that's a way of putting ourselves in the shoes of other people. And I think, again, these mnemonics for how we think about, well, let me put myself literally in the shoes of that person across the table. Where are they coming from? What are the force factors upon them? The minute we start to do that, the barriers come down. So we're able to we're able to get closer to each other, and and um, and to allow space for that conversation to happen. So I think thank you for bringing up um, a brilliant example of what you do. Second of all, I think it's a really good point around we have this is baking these things into the everyday. Another um, person I draw on in the book is Rebecca Henderson's work, and she talks about. This this kind of work that I'm talking about in five generations at work invariably happens in the everyday actions. So we're never going to get to the extraordinary unless we can have everyday actions that are breaking down silos, boundaries, whatever it is in whatever shape and form to enable the real work to get done. Gosh, you reminded me actually of a conversation I recently had with one of my kids, my six-year-old, where we were talking about the election and I got chat GPT to explain what the different parties stand for in language that a six-year-old might understand and his response to this was well obviously everyone should vote for the green party because if we haven't got a planet then none of the rest is relevant and it was so striking to me how he mm. completely reframed this yeah. is something i've probably been looking at for a, for a long time thinking about for a long time and just that cut through of that fresh perspective was wonderful to see i'm i'm curious to hear what what options do boards and board members have for taking advantage of this opportunity i love that by the way i think your six-year-old would would love the fact that uh, they're on this podcast now which is great but you speak to something which is the way it's always been seen or the way it's always been done and i think that's where we know that strong high performing boards operate on diversity of perspective they're very intentional about the shape of the board the dynamic etc and all the things that we know to be true the diversity in terms of age is something that's missing right now how we're intentional about that can show up in two ways i think one way in two approaches are essentially to look at young trustees on the board it's something that as i said i've just uh, recently come off my tenure at the wonderful ey foundation um the purpose and again context is always important so the purpose of the ey foundation is we are serving young people to enable them to have better opportunity through education and into their first careers so that's intrinsic to who we are and to what we do not to have young people at the head and heart of everything would be absolutely antithetical and wrong and so the construct of the ey foundation is to have two young trustees who are on the board and alongside the board there has always been a, a next generation board called a youth advisory board and that's quite typical as we know in nonprofits and, and civil society I think one important point um, before I go on to you know, talk about other examples about the young trustees that we also explicitly hire for an, uh, under a certain age in terms of going out to the market and recruiting and that's very intentional because, because without doing that we wouldn't get the demographic we're looking for the moment they're onboarded though they are full voting trustees alongside everybody else and so that's something that we have been doing for a long time now I have to say some brilliant examples of that is one, everything um, that we do is obviously hardwired to the business strategy from both the youth advisory board work. So that is a youth advisory board that is seen as a platform over time. Yes, it oper operates cohort to cohort, but it's very much around, well, what is our strategy <laughs> long term? What is our from and to? You know, and how can everyone, going back to Martha's exercises, do we have the right people in the room? You know, how does that look in terms of what we're trying to achieve? And the... And the second point is, 
next generation boards and corporates have not been as well recognised. We know that youth advisory boards have been around in non-profits for some time. Of course, they're adopted in different ways. The way in which EY Foundation does it is very intentional. It's invested in, it's seen as a long-term platform. But next generation boards and corporates probably didn't really hit the headlines until one of the most renowned luxury brands in the world, Gucci, became actually the poster child, if you will. (laughs) They became a global advert for a next generation board within a corporate. And you need that sometimes. Actually, at the time, that was part of their cultural and digital transformation. So when Bizzari was there as CEO working alongside Alessandro Michele, he was very much the voice for what was happening in terms of the old transformation, the people, the business as a brand that really needed to connect to new generations and new audiences insofar as its creative director was retooling the whole creativity and aesthetic of the brand. And that was important, I think, and I and I want to share this for a couple of reasons, is, is that he was vocal on this. He was vocal about, we are going to better understand who we are as business to better understand our customers. He wasn't suggesting setting up a shadow committee. The important point was that He hardwired it to the strategy. We are connecting our employee experience to our consumer experience. So the uplift of that was enormous, Ollie, because it was looking at how do we attract and retain and motivate our talent better. So in terms of flexing the employer brand, and also how are we really driving the insights from how we understand each other across an organization? This is not just us in the boardroom. You know, I am having, as a CEO, regular listening and sparring with a formed collective of millennial employees. Uh, as part of that transformation. So that was hardwired. But going back to that point about he was vocal, he was speaking at conferences, he'd go on the record in different articles. um, And and that really showed up as being something that they were serious about, talking about why it mattered, and actually, again, how people could get involved. And so that became a bit of a call to action in the corporate world to say, well, if Gucci's doing this, and look at the success, because if you chart their trajectory over that time, they're in a different trajectory now. But, you know, that was pretty much a seven year run of consistent double digit growth that was happening. And that was connected strong culture on the inside to strong culture on the outside and the rest follows so I just I'll pause there but I think that's just a a couple of things that I wanted to connect on in terms of what's happening around boards and and the shift with next generation thinking in non-profits but also now how corporates are starting to think about this in in new ways well I'd love to dive down we've been talking at the sort of 10,000 feet level maybe get into the nitty-gritty of an example because you've pioneered next gen boards for a number of organizations Perhaps we could talk about your experience of doing it at Interbrand. What was the catalyst for starting that one? I love this. We've got lots of light motifs and watchwords for this pod, Ollie. We've got catalysts and context. I love it. Very alliterative. The context is always key. So at that, po- at that point in time, Interbrand was on the cusp of a major transformation. And setting up a next generation board was something that I had had on my mind for a while. Again, as I say, I'd, you know, I'd been looking at brands, doing a lot of work with brands that represent cultures of excellence, such as Gucci, seeing things happening in the market, seeing what was happening, seeing what was on clients' minds as well. So all this context, it starts to inverge, it starts to converge. And I think in the context of the transformation that Interbrand was going through, and again, this is across a global network, and that that transformation was everything from office footprint across the network to products and services. But a people first strategy was central to that change that needed to happen. So it was a complete overhaul. And it became importantly, and actually quite joyously as you know, through a lot of the challenges along the way, the culture change was one of the biggest listening moments in the history of the business. So committing to a next generation board, which was also a first in the entire, so Interbrand is owned like by Omnicom, it was a first in the Omnicom network as well. It became a powerful sort of, oh, that's a marker and a milestone around. We are very, not only have we been through this transformation or we're going through a sizable part of it there are some some substantive things really starting to show up here and I think that when we think about how that showed up in terms of the benefits so that commitment it became a signal to the entire organization that we are really serious about putting people at the center of the organization some will say actually a next generation board by construct is is only for the few well in the same way that a board any board is composed of a of a small defined number of individuals of course there's a spectrum but that woefully and radically underestimates the cascade of benefits because typically as with any board i mean de- next generation boards and corporates tend to be on a sort of you know, 12 to 18 month tenure they rotate from cohort 
cohort to cohort, they're all working for the same company. So there are some differences there in terms of how typically, you know, a lot of boards operate with a mix of independence, etc. But it's a halo effect across the organisation that, that became important with the, what was called the Horizon Board. The, the naming actually was actually in, in positive but quite vehement anti- antithesis to the term shadow board. I don't believe anyone of any generation should be in the shadow of anyone or anything. That's no disrespect, by the way, if anyone's using the term shadow board, that's absolutely fine. But I think next generation board probably is, is a helpful mnemonic for us. But also, not just in, t- in the organisation was that starting to show up about this halo effect of, wow, OK, it's a group of 10 people here from across the global network, from Europe, from Asia to the Americas, representing all disciplines. Of course, it was that momentum and muscle that has started to build behind them. So not only does that rotate every every 18 months, but it's about the lean-in factor at a crucial moment in the history of the company that really started to, to happen. The other point was that because we talked about it, we were very open. We've just been through this process. This is the first time we've set up a next generation board. We're also in learning mode. So I was very open about how, how I was talking about it on social media and to other companies. We would love to learn from each other. Are you doing this? And I think that openness gave us a bit of a safe space going back to our safe spaces to allow it to come into being for the first time because I think one thing not just with talking about a next generation board but how many times do we see in organizations the first time you're doing things there can be so much pressure on any given construct to wrap too many metrics around it to see it to, to fill it full of different projects and initiatives better still to allow it a little bit of breathing space and actually to rethink what that shape looks like over time and certainly there are challenges along the way and we can talk about the lessons because I think also learning points are are really helpful but I think one of the benefits of how it came into being was also talking with all stakeholders from the beginning so co-creating the journey so having a blueprint was fantastic but also not only buy-in from the stakeholders who would need to sign off on it Ollie but I think also co-creating with the next generation or the potential next generation board members who we hoped would, would be serving on it so I literally went around the network talking to talking to a ton of people to get their input on here's what we think you're doing what's your what's your opinion and so we made that straw version of what a next generation board at interbrand could be inherently stronger inherently more sustainable and a lot of those voices are living and breathing breathing in the horizon board that live strong today okay so you've talked there about the impact that it has on culture the signaling effect yeah um, the openness to new ideas from uh, third party organizations what were the challenges for you on that interbrand challenges are interesting because every cohort will be different and again cohorts also vary the very first cohort of the horizon board actually it was march 2020 and we know what was happening then so the intent actually was for that board to meet in person this is a a group of 10 people across uh, europe the asia and the americas they never got to meet in person in their tenure. They became probably one of the most bonded, binded, powerful super collectives, one of the most diverse collectives as well. That's another thing to mention. Next generation boards, and that's evidence through the re- research, also show up. And there's a reason behind that, which we'll go on to talk about in terms of the process of doing this as inherently more diverse than any other collectives in the organization they're more diverse than the boards more diverse than the leadership team so that's just food for thought because there's intentionality there around what we're doing in the business again to build collaborative muscle but there's something going back to that point around what are the challenges and what changes that cohort was born as covid was taking its effect on the world so that universal common denominator meant probably they they came together faster than any other cohort would because of the context of their times. But there's lessons there, right, in in the sense of, okay, it's really important to think about every cohort needs to really bond and bind and work together. So testing for that muscle of collaborative leadership. So one of the things that I always advocate when you're looking to set up a next generation board is, do we consider applications or selections? By that, I mean, throw up always open nominations as part of your process because if you go down a selection process you're narrowing the funnel you're tapping into some of those inherent biases that you're looking to break in the first place so that's a big point because that gets us to a stronger place from the very beginning in terms of who is going to put themselves forward for this and that's really important because it's not always about the people who get tapped on the shoulder all the time it's not always about the loudest voice in the room and those are inherent biases that we see in organizations how do we elicit quiet voices how do we elicit 
you know, Jacinda who talks about, I mean, how many times did I think she get asked and said, you should consider this. And she said, I don't see myself as a leader. But how many, how many times do we hear the people who don't consider themselves a leader? And actually some of the highest performing board members have been consistently the people who have not thought this was for them. So I think also next generation boards are just brilliant, going back to a couple of challenges, but I think breaking through some of these challenges or perceived challenges are really important because that's actually building muscle in a diversity of pipeline for potential future board members that we just don't have now because we're not really hitting any of those ambitions that the world wants to talk about in terms of having more diverse boards. So if we're thinking about next generation boards within organisations, it is such a powerful platform to start bringing that mindset and skill set on early. I think another thing is also just around how the board engages with the next generation board and vice versa. So this goes back to Amy Edmondson's work. How are we bringing people together? And also what muscle are we bringing along the way? So that is going to require some degree of of unlearning. Sometimes that unlearning won't even be realised until it happens in the moment. So conversations between the board, exactly what you were talking about in the context of the climate change conversation. So a topic comes up, it's perceived in different ways, in, in a good way but we need to unlearn perhaps sometimes some of our behaviors to open up that conversation i always say that these challenges are always opportunities because if you've put the right foundations in you're able to have those conversations other things can also be imposter syndrome because if you have people who've been selected and said you have been chosen for this opportunity for the first time and that has been one of the first opportunities where they have really seen themselves in a new way in a leadership role in some shape or form, and they're working with a global collective that they've never worked with before. Again, you've also got to be mindful about what are the support systems you're putting in place to enable everyone uh, to really lean in and contribute as as part of this new dynamic, because it is part of a, a new dynamic when people are doing it for the first time. What's brilliant is once you've been through that first cohort, you're starting to build a bit of a blueprint, test and learn. But the other thing is, even if your blueprints are working well, I would always say, keep learning, keep using the information that you've got throughout each cohort to feed in and to inform because to your point the context in which we're all operating as business and society is changing i think the final point this is not a challenge but i would challenge boards who are looking to do this as never see it as a project or initiative the beauty of this is it should be a sustainable platform that really is hardwired to what you're looking to achieve as a business and that you don't see that cohort as necessarily an execution team. You see that cohort in the context of what are we looking for the board to do and the next gen board to do in the same way, right? What are we looking to achieve over time? So that's a bit of a watch out that, again, if you bake that in the right way, you'll be fine because you're, you're seeing this as a much longer term parallel with what you're doing as a company. Really hear it, pleased to hear you talking there about the the power and value of open hiring. Obviously, we're yeah. natural converts, and it builds on the work of of J R Keller, which shows open hiring outperforms closed hiring. So, it doesn't come as a surprise to me that it's such an important part of of these next gen boards as well. Uh, and and also the, the, your point there that it's a construct that has a bonding and culture building effect really resonates thinking Mm. we have a committee that meets quarterly with a representative from each of our functions that reviewed our our people analytics data and comes up with recommendations for it it's not a next gen board as such but actually one of the side benefits of that that i hadn't anticipated was that it's really helped with our cross-functional uh, bonding across teams and mm. um, also just sort of building that cultural muscle so I really like that the, 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 the next gen board can do that for you as well can you talk about maybe a couple of the case studies that, that you go on to talk about but that really you feel best bring to light some of the other opportunities and challenges offered by these next gen boards I'll choose a couple. I know I'm conscious of time, but I think one is absolutely the Financial Times um, Next Generation Board. This is a high-performing business, and the main impetus and insights were around how do we need to look differently at career paths and better access to the board? So that was really where the conversation started. And also providing, again, as I did with the Horizon Board, it was providing fresh perspectives on the business strategy, so a bit of a sparring partner. And also, it, as a process, to your point, as you have seen evidenced in your own business, how this becomes, as, as a 
as a beautiful, both intended and unintended, in a good way, consequence, a more collaborative and inclusive place to work. So that was very much the why and the impetus for it to come into being. It's now well into its fourth cohort. It op- operates on a 12-month rolling tenure. It succeeded in bridging a lot of gaps. It's not that this was a business fraught with gaps and tensions per se, actually quite the obverse. It's because of how the FT and a lot of media companies work. People are in very dedicated work streams. And the person who set this up happened to be in one of these rare bridging roles. And some of us are in organizations. I've been in those roles. And it's, it's a great position to be in because you really have that macro lens across the organization. But she said, I see that I'm probably one of few people who, who have a chance to see the business like this. And she said, a lot of people don't. And so that's really how that next generation board has really built muscle, not only as a collaborative in itself. So that's a peer network that is much more bonded and binded across, again, a global organization. But second of all, the kind of things that they've been involved in, it's, it's, it's been phenomenal. From it's, You go back to climate. So climate was, was a big one in terms of hardwiring and informing with the board. Again, not just on their own as a construct. They work hand in hand with other teams and ERGs where they are in the business, but also management support schemes to, um, and again, cross-functional work across the entire network. That term cross-functional, I have to say, I couldn't agree with you more. That is a consistent output over time. It's not that it's not seen by leaders in business, but it's one of the things that is so under-indexed. It's why a lot of the work that I do, I talk about this intersection between brand, culture, and leadership, but we also know that interdisciplinary work and cross-functional work. It's the same with a lot of my academic friends. They will also say, yes, you're so right, Rebecca, interdisciplinary thinking is not valued and monetized enough in academia, but it's where a lot of the real work needs to be done. It's the same applies in corporates. But when we think that way, that's we can really un- unleash some things. And then the second example I'll give is of one of the family businesses going back to the Pentland Group. So as you say, a lot of people might not know the Pentland Group because a lot of these families are so beautifully humble and as yours is and, and understated. They, they really are. and They don't talk about themselves very much, but they own a lot of the iconic lifestyle and sports brands from Berghaus to LS to Speedo. And the reason why family businesses are in the book, there's a huge dedicated chapter to family businesses across the world because they're generational in construct and they are thinking in longer term cycles and trajectories. And of course, they've got a enormous lessons um, for those of us who are not in family businesses but the Pentland Collective was something that the Pentland Group set up and imagine again you know this is a group business it operates across you know a series of individual brands Um, they're all broadly under lifestyle and sports but they all have very different demographics at the same time going back to your point about culture our purpose as a business and how do we need to constantly ensure that we're investing in the people that we have today but also the talent we're attracting for tomorrow and bearing in mind that you've got brands that are skewed very young in their portfolio. So one, you know, the Pentland Collective was fantastic because one of many things that supported what the Pentland Group and the family do, which is they are very intentional in how they connect employees and demographics of their employees into the demographic of their con- of, of the consumers of their brands. So one of the quotes actually from Charlie, who's one of the family members, I love it. He says, brand relevance is about how we connect across generations. And he says it as beautifully and simply as that, but how deep and resonant is that to all of us in business it's phenomenal and I think there's a couple of things in their approach it's not a next generation board per se because they didn't set it up with all the structures of the board it's probably the next thing down because one they wanted it to be bigger so it's 35 yeah, next gen employees across the network across the global network and that wouldn't have worked. Second of all, they wanted it to be a bigger sparring partner on a host of things. So everything from they've been moving their HQ. How does this group um, help us inform what our space looks like? How do we inform our reward strategy to how do we connect again our employee experience to our consumer experience? So two different examples with the FT and, and Pentland, but both hardwired into, again, good old Simon Sinek. Let's start with why. If we start with why, what are we looking to achieve with this? How does it fit within the business strategy? And again, both examples of things that have been going strong for a number of years now. Okay. And so when does it go wrong? I'm always very skeptical when something sounds too blue sky. Uh, It's uh, rarely been my experience of anything. Where do these go wrong? They go wrong when it's seen as a project or initiative. And again, I use that term quite intentionally because, again, there's research in the book which which shows actually... (laughs) 
<laughs> this proliferation of what has become actually project and initiative fatigue that you see show up in a lot of the employee listening and surveys that we do throughout organizations. And that also peaked during um, the COVID years. Again, th- out of good intention, a lot of the, the, this stuff is out of good intention. So I think if we're asking why in the first, and the, and the answer, and to your point about this big picture, it's, it, I am not suggesting by any stroke that this is for everyone. This is not, or oh, every every board needs to do this. The question that's where we have to go back to the question of why are we doing this in the in the first place? You know, going back to some of those big businesses that were hired wiring this into transformation. You know, going to the work that some of the foundations and charities and nonprofits are doing. That is from a, a, a deeply credible and authentic point of view. Because if our reason for being is to serve the opportunities for young people, then ergo we need to be thinking much more collaboratively with young people from the get-go of our organizations so the answer is not everyone needs this but i think the question always begins with let's ask why and let's second of all we we have to get away from this sort of project and initiative cycle that a lot of organizations have become caught up in as i say often it's come from good intent but these are not short-term fixes we are going back to your six-year-old or kudos to your six-year-old but we're not going to get to the problems, the bigger problems that we need to solve in business and society. And every leader, every board member listening to this, every young rising leader, that notion of collaborative leadership is so important because my thesis is honestly, Ollie, we can decide, this is part of my journey in life and what I'm doing now is also we can be part of the problem or we can be part of the solution. And it's as big picture as that. That doesn't mean to say that you, you can, you're having to sort of solve all the world's challenges <laughs> in one go. But the mindset is there, right, around we can all lean in as individuals and as collectives, as organisations and band together to be, to be part of solutions. But we're not going to do it if we have too much divisive discourse for the in the first place around generations which we have that's got to stop second of all we're not going to do it if there's too much noise in in a lot of our organizations which there is because there's an overload of too much stuff going on and third of all you know that we start we need to start thinking in terms of much more systemic and sustainable solutions so a lot of this is simply is simply saying why or why not <laughs> and then doing fewer things well and seeing them through how, how do you avoid that with something like this, that initial cynicism? Because I could imagine as a CEO, you sort of go out and say, look, we're going to do a next generation board. And if you've got an organization where there's a culture of fatigue, people probably think, oh, gosh, here we go again. Like, how, how do you show that this is not just a project and an initiative, but actually it is something longer term? Two answers to that. I would say one evidence from what others are doing that's always helpful isn't it when it's within or correlated broadly within your industry although you know where industries begin and end these days that's blowing so that's another question perhaps for another pod in itself the second point is i think have a long hard think about sort of you know if that work isn't there already for the for the board the leadership teams the stakeholders to take a look at around what are we doing in our business at the moment and what is having positive effect and why and with whom you know, if we can answer that question and it's all, you know, green cylinders, if it's not, then... So I think that's where some of those conversations start because it's helpful to say to somebody, well, then what do we stop? Because if there is an argument to say, yes, we should introduce this thinking or this platform and we should start thinking about a next generation board because this is a much more inherently sustainable solution over time and we see evidence from X, Y and Z um, and from A, B and C, um, my argument is always then are there things that would be helpful for us to stop because we're investing time and energy in things that are not being helpful and distracting? Rebecca, time has flown, which means it's time for the lightning round where I say a short statement and ask you for a quick response if you're ready. I'm ready. I I love this bit, Ollie. This is my favourite bit of your pod. Best book every board member should read and why? Hands down, Patrick Dunn boards. Boardroom behaviour that irritates you most? Not reading the room and not listening. Most valuable board ritual? I love away days. Your favourite quote? Okay, this is not going to be a one word answer because as you know I'm a bit of a quota maniac. If you allow me, if you will, to take a bit of a creative license and there are also a ton of inspiring quotes in the book. I'm going to share two fragments of a deeper read and I say fragments, I'm going to keep it short, that I love on so many levels. Toni Morrison, in her Nobel lecture speech, talked about meaning that secures our human difference. I absolutely love that. Again, go and read the Nobel lecture. It's phenomenal. That's why I'm sharing a fragment. Go and do the deeper read. And the second one, which is Anne Carson. I open with Anne Carson in the book. And she wrote, to stay human is to break a limitation. How inspiring is that? Most significant professional insight. 
The, I guess, advice that I've given over the years, if I may, I'm going to frame it like this, and I continue to give it in a number of contexts, which is most frequently when people are on the cusp of a promotion or they're beginning to work with a new manager and they ask questions and they come to you and they say, I'm really starting to think about what this means for me. What do I need to change, Rebecca? How am I going to fit that new, that new title or how I'm going to be seen by a new manager? And I'm going to squeeze another quote in here because I often talk about just be more you, lean into 150% you. And I'm paraphrasing the brilliant Joyce Carol Oates who talked about I simply became more myself. Worst professional advice you ever received? I always think the worst advice is often the most helpful, isn't it? Because you tend to remember and you think you think about that that impact on others. I think the worst advice has been to, around something along the lines of, you know, keeping the most influential and, and powerful people happy. I don't believe we're in business, Ollie, to be yes people or to surround ourselves with good enough people. So, and I think my my lesson in life has always been the people you react against or who are a bit too, you know, you are so antithetical to your spirit and to what you stand for, they have always inspired me to lean in and be all the more who I am. What have you changed your mind on about boards over time? Boards are a broad church and a broad spectrum, <laughs> to save the pun. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you got a significant judgment call wrong in the boardroom and what did you learn? That was a really interesting one. And I, I, I honestly don't have one for the first part of the question around a significant call, but I love the operative part of that question. I love, because that's always your arch move here, I know, which is what did you learn? And I think every board meeting, I've had a ritual of what have I learned from that meeting, which I've always documented. So something as always, maybe it sparked a thought for a future board meeting. It could be a way in which something was presented. So that's always been for me, doc, you know, doc, learning from every meeting and documenting that learning for myself. How are you better today as a board member than when you started? Well, first of all, yes, I am. I, I like to think I am. And I think that should be a constant over time. You know, it's it's lifelong learning for all of us. I will say one thing, and if this is helpful to anyone who is um, taking on their first, their first board role, applying for it, or considering a move during their tenure, at the EY Foundation, I was chair of the nominations committee. And that opportunity happened quite early on in my tenure. And I have to say, chairing a committee was hands down one of the best things I could ever done, I could ever have done. It's a deeper investment of your time as a board member, for sure but it paid dividends in so many ways. And finally, three things our listeners should take away from this podcast if they take nothing else. Okay, I'm going to I'm keep this punchy. So first of all, the fundamental thing is be part of the solution. Always be part of the solution in whatever shape and form you can. Your six-year-old is with us on that journey. I can feel it. It's amazing. And being part of the solution is about collaborative leadership. It's something, as I said, people like Alina Nair talks about at Chanel. And it's this power of collective intelligence and shared value. So they are the big watch words and let's live by it and do it. Second of all, as I said at the beginning, and that's why I wrote the book, we have five generations at work for the first time in history. That's a hard truth. It's a fact. We're aging. That's only going to go in one direction. It's therefore in our hands as to whether we choose to do something constructive about it or not. So this is about more collaborative, connective and innovative organisations turning this into a real opportunity. And I think third is go and make something happen. I think that's the thing. We empower ourselves and empower each other. It doesn't have to be when the book comes out, you know, 26th of September, mark the date. But my big mantra is around it's in both the everyday and the extraordinary but we rarely get to the extraordinary if we don't empower the moves in the everyday i love what you do in the in the mastermind example and i'll go back to you know have a lot of love for the martha lane foxes of the world you know she had this triumvirate which is always ask what are the problems you're solving for do we have the tools to get there and have we got the right people in the room? And that's why with five generations at work, there's a big conversation around, we have five generations in the room. What an amazing opportunity we have at our fingertips if we choose to break away from the divisive discourse and go and do something more coll collaborative and constructive about it. Rebecca, what an inspiring way to wrap up. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and insights. That's been fantastic. Thanks so much, Ollie, as ever. Fantastic to be on your best-selling pod. If you found this conversation interesting and would like to be involved in similar discussions, join the New Role Board community. Community membership gives you access to 24-hour discussion threads on boardroom challenges and opportunities like those we've been discussing. Smart online networking events, one-to-one -one career sessions with our headhunters, third-party board roles, mastermind groups, and Q&As with senior board members. Head to community.neural.com to find out more.